Good afternoon. Someday We'll Be Together was not just the last song of Diana Ross and the Supremes that they performed together, um, but it was also the last number one hit of 1969 and also the last number one hit from the decade of the 1960s. Um, and as I mentioned in our last webinar, it also reached number one on Billboard the day before our momentous ASSA meeting that took place um, uh, uh, you know, which led to our founding. Um, my name is Nina Banks. I'm the president of the National Economic Association, and I want to welcome you to part two of the founders webinar, which is part of our um, celebration of the 100th anniversary of when Sadie Tanner Mussel received her doctorate degree in 1921 and our commemoration of 100 years of African American economist. I'd also like to introduce our, um, pa our past president, Linwood Taheed. Professor Taheed was the president-elect of the NEA when we um, commemorated our 50th anniversary at the ASSA meetings in January of 2020. And that means that he was the person who organized those sessions. So we are very grateful to, to him. And I'd like to now turn it over to Professor Taheed. Thank you, Professor Banks. I was um, uh, welcome to everyone, and uh, for those who are still coming on, uh, it was it was certainly a great honor to have been um, the president-elect of the NEA, this great organization, um, and to have had the uh, responsibility for putting together the 50th anniversary uh, celebration. Um, continuing on with that, President Banks. Um, uh, continue on with the theme of 100 years of African-American economists. And, and if they say timing is everything, then it certainly was, was timed perfectly uh, for the, uh, um, uh, the observance of the 100 years of the, uh, of the uh, 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 doctorate for uh, uh, Dr. Sadie uh, Mosell Alexander, uh, the first African-American a PhD economist uh, in this country. And uh, that theme has, has carried us very well over this year uh, to, this, to this webinar, the second webinar, uh, where we are um, uh, honoring the founders of this organization a little more than 50 years ago. And, and uh, both uh, Dr. Alexander and the founders of this organization, the men and women who founded and built this organization, did so because they had a different vision for how economics uh, should be uh, understood and how it should, should contribute to the lives of, of African Americans uh, in, in uh, well, African American Blacks in this country, African Americans in particular. And so what we continue on with that, uh, this is certainly a time in which uh, the voices of Black economists, African American economists, and other economists who have alternative visions is needed. And so we are, I will, without any further ado, uh, I will uh, we'll continue on with the program with, with the hopes that the, the energy that was spurred by uh, Dr. Alexander's doctorate and by the founding of this organization 50 years ago will continue on uh, through, through the, the next 100 years. Thank you. Ms. Benga Agilori, I'm a senior economist at the Center for American Progress. I'm also the past president of the National Economic Association, and I'm honored to be here with the founders of the National Economic Association. Um, what I'm going to have is kind of talk about the reflections on the history of the NEA, some of their experiences, and then also kind of talk about the future. But first, I want to say, um, just ask them what you think the legacy in your eyes of what the NEA is, and then also to introduce yourselves too. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the most important thing for us to uh, realize is that the NEA is the foremost accomplishment of UCLA in leveraging the capability, professional capability in our community to stimulate others. 
Hmm? Introduce yourself. Pardon? To introduce yourself also. Introduce. Yeah. Yourself. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Keep that. I can say that again. I don't remember. <laughs> but anyway, I'm um, Charles Z. Wilson. Um, my main background is, and particularly with respect to NEA, I was a uh, vice chancellor for academic programs for eight years at UCLA. And it's during that period that the movement of blacks into professional organizations and also encouraging other groups to grow was stimulated from UCLA. Not only do we have the, taste, the notion of the uh, notion that we could generate leadership from a university. We had support from Charles Hitch. Charles Hitch lasts for about three years before he resigned, but his seeds were planted in the university already. His statement was essentially, we must do for the cities what we did for agriculture. And nobody has the most successful story of how we converted the land and the technology and the supposed to be the charge of our land grant universities to make the welfare of the state maximize. Berkeley came out of that. Uh, we had families that came in from our centers. University extension was all over the state. So we had a model in California that encouraged us to think big about charging the problem, changing the problems, and making the problems in use at the, in the states regarding minorities as being linked to the urbanization versus the rural. It wasn't that we didn't care about the rural, but the primary animal that we were dealing with was a wildness that was taking place in terms of our cities, particularly with respect to poor people. And as you can see today, you go to New York, you go to LA, you go to San Francisco, by our failure to grab a model that could bring along the people in the inner city areas, we now have major, major problems in this country. The leadership had to be in our cities. So when I was at UCLA, I heard that sermon going over the RAN. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, being an economist and being around smart thinking economists, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we were really into what we we're gonna do about our cities. And the black communities that, the, cause we had started the movement. The first black kid to be killed on a college campus was at Jackson State. On my watch, I was there from the, for the president to help get the uh, uh, study group started at Jackson State versus State University of New York. And I had taken down seven professors, speech, English, science, and so on, and we were gonna work out a relationship. I, that night, something stupid happened. I'm sitting up and eating dinner, and one of our kids got killed by a cop. That, to me, was a fire that went around the nation. That was what happened from that point on, the student movement started. And of course, the student movement exposed everything for us. So the NEA reflects the anguish and the urgency of trying to move from a academic world where we had tremendous capability in our med schools and in our professional schools to bring about solutions that would lead to something in our inner cities and particularly for blacks and hopefully we could spread that around others. I um, had a very interesting experience in coming to attend the meeting on Sunday morning December, I forget the date, maybe I mean, December 28th, maybe it was, 1969. Let me tell you about that. At the end of the eight o'clock session, 
that was chaired by Professor Phyllis A. Wallace, who was the African-American woman professor at the Sloan School at MIT, uh, where three papers were presented on the issue of increasing, I think, uh, African-American, uh, we would call black people at, at, at that time. That was in the era of the Black Power Movement. And C.Z. Wilson seized the microphone. He went to the podium at the end of the session, seized the microphone, and announced that following the meeting, there would be a meeting in his room, 1423, at the New York Hilton Hotel to discuss the organization of a group to address uh, participation of black people in the economics profession. Now, I was sitting next to my former professor and mentor, Andrew F. Brimmer. I, seven months earlier, I had just had been conferred the PhD degree in economics at the University of Pennsylvania and had been hired as an assistant professor in the Wharton School. There is some historic significance in that because Andrew Bremer, <coughs> earlier, about six or seven years earlier, had been the first African American ever to teach in the Wharton School. Uh, I was the second. Uh, Bremer did not stay long enough to earn tenure. He was captured away by Washington, and at the time of the meeting in New York, was a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, first African American to serve in that position. So Andy turned to his left and said to me, now Bernie, you know, I can't attend that meeting. I want you to go and report back to me. Brimmer was still treating me as a graduate student, despite the fact that I was <laughs> a professor comparable to him, though not comparable to him, a comparable to him. So I dutifully followed his direction, and I went to the meeting. In fact, I rose on the elevator. I was on the same elevator with, um, I think his name was Chalmers. He was a professor at Howard University, professor of economics at Howard University. And uh, he did not remember the name of the room, so he asked me. I had never met him. But uh, there were so few African Americans, we assumed we were going to the same meeting. So I told him, and we walked together to the meeting. I entered that meeting, and there I met C.Z. Wilson, Thad Spratlin, Carl Gregory, Richard F. America, and it turns out that Dick America and I grew up together in Philadelphia, but I had never met him. I was familiar with the name because I had read his article in the Harvard Business Review entitled, What Do You People Want? And then there was also Robert Brown and a number of others. I had not met any of them before. And shortly after the group gathered, gathered CZ gave the charge. Similar to the remarks he made this afternoon, in the luncheon, and I was gripped by what he said in his statement, because I entered economics because of a, an interest in racial inequality in American economic life. I attended a small church-related college in North Carolina, Livingstone College, which was founded by my church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, and studied economics because when I met with the counselor who met with all of the freshmen to decide what their major would be, I didn't know what I wanted to major in. 
She said, well, what are you interested in? And I told her about a story that I experienced when I was growing up in South Philadelphia in the Seventh Ward, which is the area that W.E.B. Du Bois studied for his classic study of the Philadelphia Negro. I had relatives who lived in the Seventh Ward in the late 19th century. I didn't live there at that time. My <laughs> relatives lived there. And we would go to the Ninth Street Italian Market. I, I must have been 10 or 11 years old at the time. And in the Italian market, which was an open-air market selling fruits and vegetables and meats and clothing and that sort of thing, I noticed that black people, who were at least 50% of the customers, had less money to spend than white people. I noticed that they not only had less money to spend, but their spending habits were different from that of white people. For example, when a, a black person approached the meat store, they would look in the case and always ask the price of the product before they would make the purchase. And then typically, they would purchase a small quantity of the product based upon the price. The white customers, on the other hand, would say exactly what they wanted, the kind of meat they wanted to buy. And they typically bought the more expensive meats, like uh, T-bone steaks and uh, tuck steaks and that sort of thing. And uh, that was of interest to me. Why, why is it that black people who have the same desires for purchases and so forth, spent their money differently, and why did they have less money than white people? <laughs> there was also the chicken store at the end of 9th and Washington Avenue, where the trains used to run. It was, a, it was a district area with warehouses and so forth. And most of the customers in the Giordano's chicken store were black people. And one would choose a live chicken. They would cut the head off, send the chicken through a machine that would take the feathers off and sell you the ticket. I also noticed in the purchase of um, clothing that typically the black people frequented the discount clothing shops where white people typically purchase their clothes in the higher grade clothing shops on 6th Street. And these were the kind of differences that I noticed in the spending patterns of black people and white people. Uh, most of the whites were Italians, Irish, Jewish, because that was the nature of the neighborhood. And these kinds of questions interested me. What, what, what explains these differences? So when I went to college and I was asked by the counselor, what uh, do you want to major in? And told her this story, she said, well, if you're interested in those questions, you should study economics. So I dutifully studied economics. Now it is interesting that the man who taught economics at Livingstone College earned a master's degree in economics from Harvard University under Professor John D. Black, the same man in the same program that Barack Obama's father studied for his master's degree in economics at Harvard. And he taught economics using notes that he took in class at Harvard. This was the type of education I received in this small black college in North Carolina as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, I took every course uh, that, that they offered in economics and made an A in every one of them. So the long and short of it is that I studied economics because of this interest in racial inequality in American economic life learning that it was broad, it is deep, and it is persistent. 
So when I went to the meeting and heard C.Z. Wilson articulate why this meeting was held, I said, this is what I've been waiting for. This is an opportunity for me to do something about this problem. And at that time, of course, I, I had attended um, AEA meetings since I was a graduate student because Andrew Brimmer demanded that I attend the meetings. And in fact, <laughs> he would pay my transportation to the AEA meetings as a graduate student. And in those meetings, there's another link to this. Uh, at that time, there were several African-American economists working in Washington. One was Samuel Z. Westerfield, who was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. And Westerfield would roam the halls. There were very, very few black people who attended the meetings in those days. And when Westerfield would see a dark face, he would introduce himself and tell the person who he was and ask what that person, uh, what their plans were for a career. And if you had earned your doctorate and, or you were a graduate student working on your doctorate, he would give you his card and say, contact me, because he was recruiting black people for the economics uh, jobs in Washington. Jobs were opening up for black people with degrees in economics in those days. So all of that led me, and when I heard the comments made by Marcus Alexis and uh, Carl Gregory, <laughs> Thad didn't say much in those meetings. But when he spoke, he spoke in his basso profundo voice, and he spoke with great feeling and uh, experience about the race issue. The, 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 the question was the race issue in the economics department. So those are some of my reflections on why I became involved in it, and I stuck with it over time. And one of the experiences that I have had, which was promoted and stimulated by meeting these men, Marcus Alexis and, and, and the rest of them, was the opportunity to work with other black economists who had similar interests. One of those interests was mentioned by Carl this afternoon, and that was the meetings we had few of us at the Black Economic Research Center in Harlem that was headed by Robert Brown. And we put together a, the Economic Bill of Rights, do you remember that? For all Americans, not for black Americans, an Economic Bill of Rights for all Americans, and each of us did a chapter on a topic. I did the chapter on employment, I'm a labor economist. And we would discuss that. And um, uh, Marcus was uh, asked to present that to Jesse Jackson so he could present the work to the platform committees of the Democratic and Republican Party. Well, he never did that. He, I don't know what he did with the studies. We, we finally published it in the Review of Black Political Economy. But the other experience that I've had, and I'd say this because the opportunity to meet these men greatly enriched my life and gave me an opportunity to do something with economics beyond just teach courses and write scholarly papers. I did that too, but this was an outlet for me to be active in addressing the issue that got me into economics in the first place. One of those opportunities came when Bob Brown called me one afternoon, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday, and said, 
Bernie, can you go with me to Washington on Saturday to meet with Congressman Augustus Hawkins? Augustus Hawkins was a black congressman from Los Angeles who was the chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, major committee dealing with labor topics and other topics in the education and, and, and labor field. Uh, Hawkins uh, was developing a piece of legislation called the Full Employment and Equal Opportunity Act of 1971. This was just two years after the meeting that I referred to. So I said, yeah, I can, I can join you. So uh, I took the Metroliner from Philadelphia to Washington, uh, met Bob Brown in the Union Station, and we went together to uh, Gus Hawkins' office. To make a long story short, Bob Brown and I were the two black economists advising Gus Hawkins on the development of legislation to produce full employment in the United States. That legislation later became the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act, which after some revisions in the Congress offered by Senator Proxmire of Wisconsin became the Balanced Growth and Full Employment Act of 1978, it took that long to get it through, which is the principal economic growth policy of this country today. So I say that in order to say that I hope that going forward, the members of the NEA as economists won't just spend their time teaching courses and writing papers and working toward tenure, um, but that they will use their association with other black economists through the NEA to move forward and strive for an impact on public policy that will address racial inequality in American economic life. I'll stop there because I'm very interested in the reflections of, of my colleagues. Thank you. The reason I became an economist was similar. I was very conscious of the lower relative status of African Americans uh, in the U.S. and I wanted to impact that. And I wanted to major in the subject that would empower me most to do that. And since there's such a material value in uh, uh, the ways that one gets ahead in the United States, I, uh, uh, it's uh, your financial standing, your educational le level, your handling of assets is very related to your personal mobility. And more important than that for me is that it's related to your ability to help others and pull up uh, others in your community. So I, like Bernard, decided on becoming an economist. But let me go behind, be, uh, earlier than Bernard in why this organization was so important. Uh, to found, why well, there's such a need to find, to, to develop an organization like, like this. As a graduate student in the early 60s at Wayne State and later at the University of Michigan working a doctorate, I also attended meetings of the American Economic Association uh, here uh, this year, but which meets every year around this time uh, a different large cities in the na nation. And it's a place where economists get to know each other, get to hear leading research, get to be inspired by others, get to know others who are doing path-breaking work. 
And uh, I uh, noticed that there were very few people that looked like me. Uh, and I started trying to find out how does one advance as an economist, how does one get good jobs and so on. And the answer is, is that uh, you first get a good education and then you uh, write scholarly articles. You get a lot of exposure where others can see the quality of your work and that leads to getting good jobs and promotions and so on. But one of the big avenues for getting promotions is appearing at economic conventions like this, where people can see you and the quality of the work you do. And uh, uh, I would look at the conventions and I would see very few people who looked like me. And the ones that I saw were already established, doing their own things primarily. Uh, so I decided that uh, uh, I was going to uh, try to get affiliated with others so we could change uh, the system where one can be invited to present their research, one could get invitations to appear on panels, uh, one could be discussants while others were uh, uh, giving papers and so on. And since a lot of decisions were made by, by whites who had the, the higher ranking position and so on, there's very little uh, invitations to blacks to appear in these panels. And, and these panels are presented by organizations. And we didn't have a, an organization of black economists at that time. So that makes uh, uh, what Bernard uh, spoke about uh, as what led to the formation of this, uh, this uh, the NEA so important. So I was very glad to uh, uh, participate with the other founders here in organizing the, this. And little did I believe when this was founded in 69 and 70, that 50 years from then I would be here honored with other <laughs> Uh, uh, founders here, uh, uh, and that what's more, and this brought me to tears. I looked around the audience and I saw these young black economists. You know, I listened to them present papers and critique other papers, and they were as good as we were, if not better. Uh, uh, and it was the fulfillment of a dream. I'm so proud for my part in organizing this. Yeah, I would guess in thinking of the NEA legacy, I would make three points uh, that in its mission, NEA has always been uh, about what I would call either ameliorating or responding to or reducing the impact of of institutional racism uh, and or adding to capacity building for doing the kinds of things that both Bernard and, and Carl suggested. So to me, the enduring legacy of what NEA has accomplished is all of the contributions. If you look at where economics would be on issues of race, As a matter of fact, the whole uh, ec economics of racism, I think, wouldn't be where it is today if you didn't have the collective contributions from the Review of Black Political Economy and, and the contributors of, uh, to it. So uh, I think finding ways to uh, continue that. On the capacity side, I would say finding ways to build a pipeline because even though we continue the um, the summer program, the pipeline is still thin. Just in conversation, a, a student uh, of Bill Brad uh, of Bill Bradford, uh, it mentioned that uh, years ago. Uh, 
there were 30 students in the program. Now, I don't know what the current is, but the pipeline still, if you start with a relatively small number as undergrads that you're developing, and you look at all of the major universities and PhD programs, it's pretty hard to see breaking through in larger numbers. So uh, NEA's work is going to be unending and finding allies and other ways of, of really doing that. And I guess the other point that I would make is I think uh, NEA offers uh, a dual path that, that we will, I think, always need an NEA, no matter what uh, opportunities and how much participation we have on programs, panels, even eventually becoming officers and whatever, that it, we need to be real that our struggle is going to continue because institutional racism is a part of the fabric of what we do. Thank you. Uh, the NEA was born in the middle of the tumult of the 60s, uh, grew out of the civil rights movement, and that spirit uh, is fundamental to where we are today and the next generation or two. Uh, four quick points. Uh, relating to what the organization can add to its outstanding and solid record uh, built so far. Uh, building institutions and continuing and deepening activism. Uh, I mentioned in my remarks earlier uh, that the review of black political economy was intended, among other things, to have a policy impact. It's succeeded very well at being an academic uh, platform for young and, and all other scholars, uh, but uh, either the review or some other mechanism, such as a blog or a newsletter, uh, needs to be created that will intentionally, deliberately, uh, strategically try to impact the direction of policy debate on the matters of priority to us in education and housing and employment, business development, and a couple of other broad policy areas. Uh, related to that is the creation of a think tank. This has been discussed over the years, tabled, set aside. It might be timely now to pick that up again for the leadership of the organization uh, and the membership broadly to create a think tank, either freestanding or associated with any number of other uh, Washington or New York or in other places, perhaps at some university, and in a partnership or affiliation of some kind, whatever is feasible uh, at whatever scale, but a active uh, policy analysis institution that will carry on the work in that way. And related to that is the need for ongoing financial resources that are secure. So we need to think about building an endowment somehow. Easy to say, harder to do, but uh, that's a challenge that the NEA might uh, take on uh, in its own best interest to build a modest endowment that can uh, be there in good times and bad times. And finally, the fourth point, the economics departments at the historically black colleges and universities, about 100 of them, a handful of them are strong. Uh, many need help. Uh, and the NEA might take that on as a priority project, that we're going to work with 50, 60, 80, HBCUs for the next 10 or 15 years and help those departments become perhaps the strongest single department on that campus. Uh, stronger than psychology or history or biology, whatever uh, is in competition for student attention uh, and resources. Let us decide that
that economics is going to be a, uh, a brand differentiator at the HBCUs, that we're going to be known for having strong economics programs, uh, whatever else they do. Uh, so uh, those are a few concrete, I believe, uh, realistic and achievable uh, objectives for the next 20 to 50 years. And we'll all be here 50 years from now <laughs> to celebrate those milestones. Thank you. I want to, I wanted to actually ask, uh, hopefully get quick responses. Um, I was a ABD um, at the time of the formation of the NEA, and uh, I blame Dick America for <laughs> <laughs> for introducing me uh, to the caucus. Um, and and I guess the question that I have is that most of the time you think of these organization professional associations as being very hierarchical, and so I guess that my question about the past and the future is how did you see graduate students and junior faculty within the NEA? What did you see as both their role and their benefit? And therefore, what should the NEA think about now as we have not enough, but a growing number of junior faculty and graduate students um, within economics, uh, people of color, how do we harness that energy without harming them in terms of their progress in the field, as, as Carl talked about the things that they have to do. So I'll pass it down and, you know, anybody who wants to make a comment can do so. If you want to pass, that's fine too. Well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll comment on briefly on that, that economics I'm, I don't have a PhD in economics. I, somehow you guys uh, allowed me to participate with my MBA uh, because it was early days. It was the 1960s. There were only 15 or 20 of you with doctorates. So I fit in and uh, made my contribution as best I could. Uh, I consider myself a policy analyst, which is kind of a fuzzy term. What's that mean? Uh, but that's how I consider the NEA, that it's, it's economists and related policy analysts. So that means people teaching similar related uh, fields in schools of public policy, in business schools, maybe in agricultural economics, and in other allied uh, fields. And we might, to answer your question, be more proactive in how we reach out to uh, people getting PhDs or in the pipeline or even uh, closely related uh, degrees, uh, it should be our policy, our practice to initiate the contact and to uh, extend ourselves to them as soon as we learn that they exist, that they're out there. And that could be the work of a, sub of a committee uh, whose job is to basically market. Yeah, just a couple of points. One on uh, resources that uh, Richard mentioned. Uh, th there's something we haven't talked about called the Black Economist Development Project that again, it's easy through Ford Foundation and Peter DiGenosi funded the four, the, the four years of that we had resources to uh, do workshops. We, we developed graduate students as, because we knew that they were the future of the professoriate. So, and that just ended because the, the program and the project was not funded, but you need, the, as it was an ancillary kind of effort, but it had the resources of the Ford Foundation that really fostered that. So uh, I, it seems to me that, uh, again, re re considering what 
uh, business model or what sustaining revenue base so that if uh, that it becomes possible to grow your own and we looked at graduate students as future members which is which is happening on that there are several steps along the way from going from high school to college to graduate school and getting a PhD. Finally, you need to think through each of these steps and develop programs well, and decide which way along the way is the critical bottleneck and give that priority and then the next critical and so on. Uh, one of the major limitations on students majoring in economics to begin with is the math requirements. That's what, in my experience, has weeded out most of the students. And they're good students, but when you come from low-income communities, low-tax bases, homes that are fairly inexpensive, so the property tax is not, does not enable a lot of support, uh, uh, it's very difficult to attract the teachers who are good at teaching math because they tend to require more income than others and so on. So that's one step along. I, I, I don't know how we can impact that, but any program that, that increases the chances of hiring math, good math teachers that can deal in underprivileged neighborhoods and get students to do well, uh, there can be support there. But above that, uh, our, probably one of our strongest pro program is the summer program uh, uh, it, uh, where we take good, uh, where we take students who are doing well but uh, who may be inclined to go in other ways but are interested in economics and we give them the tools to survive in tough graduate schools. We, we, we do that very well. In fact, a large, people in the, a large number of the people in the audience today the younger people, under 30 or 40 or 50 in some cases, they came through our pro program. And uh, so I don't know that that's the, we can strengthen that if we can, but that's not the critical thing. Uh, we might also look at another step along the way, is, which is the, the, uh, uh, the first, the, the the getting the first job and uh, the first two years as an assistant professor. What sort of things can we develop to give them, to help them move on much, much rapidly than just on, on their own? Is there anything we, we can provide? And uh, those were the, the three stages that I would look at, but there may, may be others. But the, in each, when we make a choice though, is where we can make the maximum effort with the resources that, that, that we have. We can't work every way. We've got to look at ooh, the biggest bang per buck. Well, thank you very much. In responding to Margaret's question, uh, I, would be, I would make three points. One, I always saw the NEA as an antidote to the isolation I felt as a black economist in academia. That is, and you, you raise an interesting question. Uh, at that point in time, and to a considerable extent even today, those of us in the mainstream, that, that is, I won't say the mainstream, the non-HBCU context, are working almost in isolation from other black economists. Uh, I was the only black economist at the University of Pennsylvania. The second one arrived, he is Gerald Jaynes, arrived five years into my experience at the Wharton School. The difference was this. I was a, an economist in the Wharton School, not in the economics department. And 
we have a colleague, uh, what's his name, uh, Price, Gregory Price, who continues to say that, uh, suggest, well, you're not an economist, you're not, an, that's nonsense. 60% of the faculty of the Wharton School are economists. <laughs> they have PhD degrees in economics. Jerry was an assistant professor in the economics department. Regrettably, he did not get tenure. So after five years, he went to Yale, where in two years, he did get tenure. I think Jerry Janes was the second African-American tenure professor at Yale University in the economics department. So the NEA offered me an opportunity to collaborate with to f gain sustenance from and to learn from other black economists on issues of great importance to me, which was economic inequality in American economic life. The other thing is that with respect to the NEA's role with respect to graduate students or undergraduates, that was the pipeline, that is the pipeline Summer Institute project, which Marcus Alexis developed. And I had early discussions with Marcus through the NEA, having met him and so forth, to discuss what might be done to achieve the first goal that was stated for the creation of the Caucus of Black Economists, and that was to increase the supply of black economists. And I am very grateful for the opportunity that I had when I was director for social sciences at the Rockefeller Foundation to collaborate with Marcus to develop that, uh, he developed it, conceived of it, planned it, brought it to me at the Rockefeller Foundation for funding. Had I never met Marcus Alexis through the NEA, I don't think that opportunity would have been available. Because being an insider in a foundation where you have control over money made it possible to address the issue that you raised. You see, to support a pipeline of black people, men and women, who are interested in study, you can encourage them to study economics, you can provide support for them through the summer program to increase their capacity to get through these graduate programs. Now let me address the third point that you raised, and that is the mathematical requirement. That is a non-starter for me, and has always been, because I am a devotee of institutional economics as a labor economist. All economists must have a capacity for quantitative analysis. But this nonsense of overemphasizing quantitative analysis and these esoteric forms of quantitative analysis and heteroscedasticity and all of that business. To me, that is a non-starter for using economics as a tool of analysis to address the issue that I am interested in, and that is racial inequality in American economic life. That is why, through my work, I have always emphasized the institutional economic approach rooted in the University of Wisconsin, Commons, and, 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 and Stigler, and, and others. Uh, John Dunlop at Harvard and other institutional economists. And I think that what I would like to see is NEA not being a toady to the economics profession with this overemphasis on mathematics and quantitative analysis and econometrics, the esoteric econometrics. What does that tell you about the problem of economic inequality in employment, income, and wealth? 
It doesn't tell you a hell of a lot, in my opinion. And so I would like to see more young economists, black economists, learn more about institutional economics as a tool of analysis rather than having this overemphasis on mathematics and quantitative analysis as a way of entering the economics profession. You know, uh, economists um, once held the role of being the queen of the social sciences, or the king of the social sciences, however you want to put it, in that we seem to have invited other disciplines to come into economics. If you go back to the uh, starting of the earlier economists, Many were psychologists. Mm -hmm. uh, many were uh, weather people. But we found in some ways that economics, it has a broad framework in which to look at the behavior of people. And one of the things we have to stress as we move forward with the NEA we want to encourage interdisciplinary thinking on the part of economists. Because that's how we generate the next generation of economists. They generally come out of people who are in this interdisciplinary sphere that we're talking about. Yes. You know, I like to think today of finance. Those who are in economics today and started 50 years ago, would have never gone into finance. <laughs> you know, it was a subject of those who were in connection and who had the things to do and so on. But today, we find the MBA and the finance major and the finance scholar, such as we had at UCLA, which produced Nobel laureates in economics, okay? Uh, we are an interdisciplinary group. We're born from that essence. We should continue that. Uh, my joy of being an economist is not ever taking myself serious as an economist, but taking myself serious as one who understood economists and seriously knew how to make what economists had on the table brilliant ideas, make them work for my community. We have to teach kids coming in, particularly black kids, that economics is a pathway to become a professional and go into problem solving. You don't have to go into economics for a PhD, but if you go in as an undergraduate, and hang around economists and pick up a master's or get in a collection of research and so on, and then go to law school, I guarantee you, your focus is going to be in economics somewhere. So what we have to encourage, encourage it as NEA is interdisciplinary push that we have to have with all of our kids. We can't say, I want you to be an economist, and the first thing they say, well, I don't understand the mathematics. Mm -hmm. That's not where we want to go. We want them to think about problem solving, social problem solving. We have the tools, more so than any other discipline, to engage in social problem solving. It was the joy that I had doing a, doing a, pushing the calculators, doing least squares for Robert Ferber, who was the father of marketing. He was an economist who decided he was going to make the consumer behavior the heart of his what he wanted to do. I enjoyed being in these bureaus who were concerned about pushing businesses. They weren't concerned about the economics. Anybody who was in the economics would come in there and talk like they wanted them to talk. Then you could get into forecasting and all the things you want to be. We are the sort of like the baseline disciplines of dealing with social problems, wherever you go. And I think we ought to encourage other social science students who have an interest 
and what we would call economic issues to join us in NEA in workshops. I would like to see workshops that we sponsor. Uh, I would like to see us go. We, we're sitting on, in LA now, something like $150 million, more than that, to do housing. We're hung up on political issues. But I'm looking at it, I see some economic issues there in the planning and putting that stuff together. We need people who want to solve problems to come in to the NEA and bite into the apple that we call economists with the understanding that we can still eat that apple, eat as much as we want to, and we can go another discipline. And that will strengthen us as a leading institution of developing young people. And we've got to have that base to build a base of quote, professional economists. We draw from people who have an interest in economics and they have a narrow interest in the subject of economics, the power of the subject. So we've got to embrace both of those as we go forward. That's my thoughts. Let me begin by saying how happy I am to see so many people of color in the room today. It is especially good to have people who have served the organization throughout the 50 years we have been in existence. And we're very fortunate in having some from the very beginning. But it's also great to have the most recent generations of black economists with us as well. The days when Marcus Alexis and Carl Gregory fell into each other's arms because they were so excited to see another black economist at the annual meeting are hopefully behind us for good. This turnout is a tribute to the hard work of the planning committee who wrote, emailed, and called people to get them here today and to see how many people from all the different eras of the organization is just a tribute and a testament to how much work they put into it. The NEA has kind of been part of uh, my career development. Uh, even when I was a graduate student uh, at Howard University, they were there from the inception and really helped guide and, and, and kind of promote what are some of the interests that I have. And then when I was able to become uh, assistant professor, uh, they were there to help mentor me through this whole process. So my first people were Margaret Sims, <laughs> who then said I had to know Barbara Jones and Charles Betsy, um, and also Waleen took me under wing. In fact, they were the ones who suggested that I apply for the NEA Federal Reserve Board Dissertation Fellowship which I did, um, and I got, I received, and so that kind of just immediately, I was in the whole move movement and the whole group, and everybody embraced me. I would like to thank the five founders in the room, CZ Wilson, Carl Gregory, Thad Spratlin, Dick America, and Bernie Anderson. As, I'm not done. <laughs> As well as, as, well as uh, Marcus Alexis and Bob Viles, who are no longer with us. And I want to thank them for supporting me, promoting my work, and prodding me to serve on various NEA and AEA boards and committees. The enduring legacy of what NEA has accomplished is all of the contributions. If you look at where economics would be on issues of race, As a matter of fact, the whole economics of racism, I think, wouldn't be where it is today if you didn't have the collective contributions from the Review of Black Political Economy and, and contributors uh, uh, to it. If NEA can uh, really focus on keeping and stimulating the interest in economics and finance at the undergraduate level, and primarily um, securing these undergraduate degree grant and programs, I think that'll uh, be, a, be a big help in terms of uh, moving forward in the next uh, 50 years. I'm an activist by heart, and I grew 
from this experience. And I'm extremely proud with this movement, we changed the whole economic, American Economic Association. We changed it. But I think we have to keep running hard, kicking butt, and move forward. Thank you. I want to say that all that the NEA has accomplished in 50 years has been because we've stood on the shoulders of giants. I have one word to describe the NEA. It is love. We have an obligation to continue to address the challenge of race in the American economic profession. When you're in a position and you have a little power and influence, I have always been committed to use these positions to advance the race. So I would congratulate you, those of you who have been working in this organization, continue, keep, keep your foot on the pedal. The challenge is great, the responsibility is clear, we can do it, we will do it. I won't be around the next 50 years, but you will be here and this organization will continue to have a great impact on the opportunities for black people. Thank you for joining us.